And joining us now on the debate for the full hour tonight in Berkeley, California, Irene Blumrad, professor of sociology at the University of California at Berkeley. In Lethbridge, Alberta, Abdi Kazemipur, professor of sociology at the University of Lethbridge. And with us here in studio, Randall Hansen, Canada Research Chair in Immigration and Governance at the University of Toronto, and Quam McKenzie, psychiatrist at CAMH, that's the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, and the University of Toronto. Good to see you gentlemen here in the studio and to our friends online and points beyond. Nice to meet you both and have you on our program tonight. We are going to share some polling numbers off the top of the program today that I suspect will surprise a lot of our viewers. And Michael, without further ado, let's go right to these. These are Angus Reid numbers from a few months ago. On the issue of multiculturalism, is it good or bad? 55% think multiculturalism has been very good or good for Canada, and 30% regard it as bad or very bad. Perhaps not much surprise there. A majority of Canadians like multiculturalism. Let's pick it apart a little more. Next graphic, if we can, Michael. How about multicultural mosaic? Bad? 33 support. 33% support the idea of the mosaic, which deems cultural differences to be valuable and to be preserved. 54%, the majority, want Canada to be a melting pot where immigrants assimilate and blend into Canadian society. Randall, to you first. Those are not the numbers we expect to get when we talk about mosaic versus melting mm -hmm. pot in Canada. So what are you taking from those numbers? Well, I think the polling numbers show something that those of us working in the field have known for some time, and that is that whilst Canadians are strongly in favor of immigration, they also strongly support integration, if not assimilation, and indeed are in some ways more assimilation than the Americans. The question is, how do you square the circle? Mm. And it seems to me when you ask Canadians about multiculturalism, you're not really asking them about what we might think of as a multiculturalism, integrating through your culture and keeping it separately. We're rather asking them, A, about immigration, which they like, or B, about that eternal Canadian quest, which is being different from the Americans. And the word multiculturalism is different from what they think of in the case of the Americans, melting pot. And therefore, it's popular because it's an affirmation of Canadian identity, it has nothing to do with immigrants. Hmm. Abdi, how would you like to come in on that? What did you take from those numbers? Um, I think I, I'm not surprised of the numbers as uh, uh, Dr. Hansen mentioned, but uh, I have to caution against reading too much into these numbers because these numbers are coming to surface at the period that we are going through one of the worst economic recessions of our time and normally in circumstances like this there is a wave of nativism that comes to surface and uh, uh, sort of a heightened uh, sense of anti-immigration uh, sentiments and also we are living in the post September 11 era so those are quite uh, natural consequences of the period in which we are living I'm uh, thinking that probably in the absence of these major events we would see a totally different opinions profile hmm. Irene um, as an American you may not know this but certainly in Canada the conventional wisdom has always been we like our mosaic better than your melting pot these numbers suggest that conventional wisdom may be wrong. What do you want to say on that? Uh, first, I'll correct the first part. I actually am Canadian in the United States. Um, well, thank you so for that correction. How about that? I was go I was, now here, I was going to say, I think you're a Dutch American, but obviously you're a Dutch Canadian. She's okay. Canadian, yeah. Good stuff. Let's there clarify that right off the top. <laughs> <laughs> so it does give me a very interesting perspective, I think, um, in that I do agree with Randall that Canadians like to see their national identity as multiculturalism to contrast it to what they see as the American melting pot. But I think they overestimate the degree to which Americans actually believe they have a melting pot or even some Americans want a melting pot and the reality on the ground in the United States in many respects is actually quite similar to the Canadian reality. Uh, there's another thing that I'd like to highlight though with those polling numbers. Um, one of the things that's really interesting is that the young people in the Angus Reid survey were much more favorable to multiculturalism and more favorable to the mosaic uh, than the older Canadian respondents. And I think this suggests that there's also a generational shift as younger people are probably feeling more comfortable in terms of the diversity of Canada than older people who have seen very you know, significant changes in their lifetime. I just did the worst thing you can do, Irene, didn't I? I called a Canadian an American. There's no bigger insult in this game, is there? I am sorry about that, and I'm going to feel terrible about it for the rest of this hour. Let's see if we can get past it. Oh, I can't it. say anything. My, my children are both Canadian and American, so... So you're on the border on this one. No pun intended. 
Okay, right. Quam, let's just pick the numbers apart a little bit more. Uh, in Ontario, the province in which we are originating this broadcast, the numbers for those who defend the multicultural mosaic is somewhat higher, 38%, while those who opt for the melting pot model is 50%, a little bit lower. So does that make us somewhat atypical in this discussion here as Ontarians versus the rest of the country? Probably not. I think that uh, the numbers are very close and there's always going to be an error with uh, regards to any polling, so the numbers are probably not that different. I, I think sometimes these uh, uh, polls can be misleading, partly because we presume that we, know what, that we know what people were thinking of when they answered it. So we think that we, knew, that we know what people were thinking when they said that they thought that the melting pot was good or the mosaic was good. So these are terms you think the respondents may not fully appreciate? Uh, they're terms that um, we may have a different, you know, we may have a different view, and I think that's what Randall was saying. That um, you know, when people talk about the mosaic, they're some, they're in part talking about the mosaic, but they're also talking about being different from uh, the Americans. And mm. certainly, some people who are coming here, like me, when people are talking about um, what the melting pot would be, I don't know which pot I would actually melt into. I mean, if we did it chronologically, we'd all be melting into an Aboriginal or First Nations pot. Mm -hmm. If we did it in Toronto by the size of the population, then we would say that 78% of people who are first or second generation um, would uh, be the pot that the 22% of people who are called standard, Ameri uh, standard Canadian. See, now I've done it. You've uh, got me doing it's it. It's contagious now, yeah, isn't I'm it? I'm calling you a Can <laughs> an American. Just because you spent some time there, you've been tarred with a brush of being Canadian, <laughs> uh, being American. So, um, you know, who, where do we melt into? You know, is it done on the size of the population? Is it done on the number of the long length of time people have been here? What are we talking about? And what is it to be Canadian anyway? What are we melting well, that, into? That's the huger question. We are going to get to all this. But I want, Randall, I want to go back to you because I know when Abdi talked about the Great Recession and the role that that might potentially be playing in the uh, influencing of those numbers, uh, your eyes went up. What did you uh, want to react to there? Well, I just want to reject the idea that this is any, any way sort of a rogue poll or that it, it has something to do with the recession. It doesn't because we've got this number before. I've seen data like this for years and years, including 2006, about the peak of the most recent economic boom, where Canadians are asked very clearly, should uh, immigrants be reasonably accommodated? Very loose language, reasonably accommodated, mm -hmm. or should they fully adapt to Canadian culture? Strong language. Whatever that means. Sure, whatever it means, we have to go that. But that's, a very, that's comparing quite a strong assimilationist stance with a very weak multicultural one. And over two thirds said that immigrants should fully adapt. So I think the notion that Canadians, I mean, I believe to state it directly, Canadians are deeply integrationist in their attitude towards uh, immigrants. And this is not new, this is a structural fe feature of opinion in this country. Abdi, again, when you break down the numbers provincially, we saw in Ontario it was a little more one way versus the other. In Alberta, it's a little more the other way. Albertans, 60 percent in favor of the melting pot idea, a little more than the national average. Uh, how would you interpret the way things are where you are right now in that province? Yes, actually, in the, in the research that I have done recently, I have noticed and, uh, that partly speaks to the feasibility of using these notions of melting pot and uh, cultural mosaic. Uh, I have noticed that there, are, uh, there is a lot of variation uh, within the country in different regions. For example, I found that the highest level of support for assimilation and the sort of melting pot uh, idea was found in Quebec and in Montreal specifically, and the lowest level in uh, Vancouver, which is something that is represented in this uh, public opinion uh, poll as well. And I think that has a lot to do with uh, not this sort of a universal trend that is uh, going through Canada as, as a whole nation, but the kind of things that are happening in different regions and the kind of interactions and experiences that people have with diversity. And I think those experiences are much more pleasant in a place like Vancouver compared to what it is in uh, Montreal. And that is the fact that is creating these uh, sort of regional differences. Well, let me follow up on that with Irene. Irene, you proud Canadian. You marvelous Canadian, you Irene. Very Canadian <laughs> to your bones, Irene. Uh, the province, Abdi is quite right, the province, again, if you break down by province, the province with the highest support for the melting pot idea is, in fact, Quebec, 64%, well above the national average. And the one more, most supportive of the mosaic is the one just north of you, British Columbia, 42%. What's your view of the discrepancy of those two numbers? 
Well, if we understand the debate around mosaic and melting pot partially as a debate about national identity in Canada, Quebecers, in a certain respect, are um, much less uh, they much, they're much less worried on one level about their national identity because they know they're Quebecois, and especially for Francophones, they have a very distinct culture. And so the idea that people would want to melt into that culture is something that they find attractive. It's Anglophone Canadians who are probably a little bit more worried about being mistaken for Americans. And so the contrast with the United States in terms of mosaic and melting pot seems more salient, I think, among an Anglophone audience than among a Francophone audience. Hmm. Randall, you want to follow up on that? Quebec being the most? BC being the least? Uh, no, I mean, I largely, I largely agree with what Irene said, and I would simply add to that that, uh, well, she said it, but I would emphasize the point that Quebecers have a profound, unlike English Canadians, sense of their own nationhood, mm -hmm. and of its value and worth. They know much more than we do who they are, and what flows from that is a greater sense that there's something worth integrating into. Gotcha. Abdi, let me go back to you. Is the shift away from the mosaic a reflection of the conflicts in this country today, or is it more likely anxieties imported from somewhere else, Europe, whatever? I, I, I think part of it is definitely uh, the importation of the debates that are happening in Europe without really having the realities on the ground similar to what is, what is there in Europe. So that is part of it. But also I think it is also a natural uh, response to the rising diversity, uh, sort of a rapidly rising diversity in Canada as a result of its immigration. Uh, so it, I have to go back to uh, one of the comments that uh, Dr. Hansen made. I don't uh, suggest that uh, there is no backlash against diversity and there is no uh, resentment about that. I think uh, it has been on the rise, this has been, these sentiments have been on the rise uh, gradually over the past uh, couple of decades. But I think the situation in Canada is totally different and uh, therefore we don't see the level of uh, resentment that is there in Europe and not even in the United States here in Canada. That is partly because of the nature of the immigrants that we get. We get. They are mostly uh, coming from uh, with high education and they are doing very well, so they are not the sort of underclass type of immigrants that uh, you can find in some of these countries. And also, culturally also, they are very different. So I think that debate is not uh, representing the current situation in Canada very accurately, but it is something to take into account and to uh, engage in, at least to prevent uh, something like Europe uh, European situation to happen here in Canada. Quam, I'd be interested in your take on this, given that you used to live in London, UK. I think my take on it would be that the idea of a mosaic is very attractive, because uh, mosa mosaics are very attractive, but they're a purposeful picture. You get the different uh, colors and you put them all together and you stick them in place and you keep them in place, oh. and that's what a mosaic is. So you have to put a lot of effort into making a mosaic. Hmm. Now. Canada talks about a mosaic and probably got away with it when immigration was, um, was less diverse, but now it's more diverse. People actually do have to do the work of the mosaic. They have to think of who's coming. They have to work out how to keep people in place, and they've got to decide what sort of picture we want for the country. That's what a mosaic is. We haven't got a mosaic. We've got a whole bunch of people who just come and we haven't thought it through, and we haven't done the work we need to do in order to make sure that people get what they want out of the um, agreement that we make with them. They come to pay our pensions and build our country, and we give them something in return. Well, if it's not what, a mosaic, what do you want to call it? At the moment, it's, it's an unstructured, <laughs> I don't know what I'm going to call it. It's just a mess? It's a Jackson Pollock painting? Um, Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Randall, you want to follow? Yeah, I just want to. There, there's four things we need to keep quite distinct here. There's hostility towards immigration. There's hostility towards Muslims and Islam. There's support for opposition to multiculturalism, and there's support for immigration. Now, what I do agree with is that there's less hostility to immigration and towards Muslims mm -hmm. in Canada than in Europe. And on the particular question of Islam. We should be careful about importing to Canada fundamentally European debate when, as was said, we have very different Muslim populations in this country. Entirely agreed. I think we can take that as read. However, I don't, what I want to keep off the table, or what I don't want to embrace, is the notion that there's anything pernicious, suspicious, 
uh, disreputable about opposing multiculturalism and supporting integration. At the very least, it's entirely consistent with strong support for immigration on the one hand and also for sociological multiculturalism, which is to say you can love all of the um, sociological aspects of diversity, people from different experiences, different language, different restaurants, and still believe in a common core to which we all hmm. subscribe. And that, to me, is what integration means. So I strongly support immigration, but I'm suspicious of substantive multiculturalism, but strongly support sociological multiculturalism. Graham, you want to come back on that? I, I, I did, but I think Randall got to the place where I was trying to trying to understand what you meant by integration. Sure. Uh, because you're talking about integration into society rather than assimilation where people lose their heritage and their culture. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, sure, should I respond to that? Please. So, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, integration for me is fundamentally, first of all, economic and educational. So you want a situation when your immigrants are indistinguishable in terms of their economic achievements, so they earn as much or as more as everyone else, and their educational achievements. And then also a very broad framework to do with uh, civil liberties, gender equality, the rights of sexual minorities that everyone signs up to. And beyond that broad framework, there's a massive degree of individual diversity allowed. And if we make the American Canadian comparison, you are incredibly hard pressed to say what you can do in Toronto that you can't do in Los Angeles or New York City mm -hmm. or Boston or frankly, if we're talking about sociological multiculturalism, London. One more shot at Equam and then I want to hear Irene on this. The reason that I brought that up is because there is a lot of research which shows that assimilation where you lose your own culture is bad for your health, is bad for your mental health, but is also bad for your kids' mental health. And so the idea of being able to be Canadian, to integrate and to get um, sort of uh, economic and uh, social integration in Canada, but keeping your cultural heritage is quite important if we're talking about moving forward with a healthy population, both physically and psychologically. Can I get Irene to weigh in on those four areas? Uh, do you think that uh, Randall has kind of summed up the four areas uh, that we ought to be debating on this? I. I would point out that I think Randall's right that on the ground, if you're in Toronto or if you're in one of the very diverse American cities, that much of your daily existence would be very similar. The tolerance for hyphenated identities or, you know, buying foods that are from your native land or your grandparents' native land, for that matter, is very high. Um, great tolerance for religious diversity, et cetera. There is a difference, though, in the United States and Canada in the way that diversity is articulated. In the United States, States, um, as many viewers probably know, there's much more emphasis on what's called pan-ethnic or racial categories. So people are African American, Asian American, Latino in the United States, and those are very salient categories to people. Whereas in Canada, the way we talk about it is very different, either national origin um, or ethnicity, uh, Chinese uh, Canadian, Indian Canadian, I Italian Canadian or the, the sort of amorphous category of visible minority. And that offers both opportunities, I think, in Canada and also perhaps creates some problems in terms of addressing racism. And in, to a certain extent, I think the debates that we're seeing right now around the mosaic or the melting pot in Canada is uh, debates around trying to figure out how to make sure that there's an equality of opportunities for all Canadians. And I think if, if we're talking about metaphors, I, the metaphor that I would like is more sort of an impressionistic painting of Canadian identity where it's not set in stone, it's not the mosaic where each tile can't move, but it's definitely not a Jackson Pollock painting either, <laughs> where there is a sense of a core Canadian um, notion of what it is to be Canadian, but it's one that can shift or people can see different things into and that has shifted over the last hundred years. Abdi, let me get you on that, this notion that we're really more of an impressionistic painting than a Jackson Pollock, what do you want to call it, mess, or lack of organizing principle. Uh, <laughs> Go ahead. Yes, I, yes, I, I think uh, it might be helpful when we are thinking about uh, these different scenarios of integration versus multiculturalism to think first of uh, identity integration as pro probably the most fundamental type of integration that we can think of. All the sort of cultural integration, educational integration, economic integration are great and they have to be there, but they are not sufficient. They are just setting the stage for this last, and in my view, the most uh, fundamental type of integration, which is identity integration. So feeling 
uh, having a sense of belonging and having uh, a sense of sort of common identity with the rest of the population. That's one point. The second point is that when we are thinking about this identity, we should stay away from thinking about just one identity per person. So they don't have to choose one identity over another one. They can have, and they do have people, uh, multiple identities. So I guess the question would become how they can manage these multiple identities in a way that it creates an identity profile that is shared also with the rest of the population. So in that regard, I think, and some of the research that they have done has, has shown this, that people who have felt more welcome here in Canada and have been uh, free to practice their own religion and to feel comfortable with their own religious or ethnic identities, they have been more likely to also develop a sort of common and shared identity as a Canadian. So uh, I think it might be helpful to, to start thinking about these identities as sort of a multiple thing and the fact that the integration and multiculturalism are not two uh, contrasting scenarios, but something that they can live within each other. Okay, Abdi, let me follow up very briefly with you, since you talk about multiple identities. How do you self-identify? I identify my, myself as, depending on uh, what is the sort of main issue at hand, as a Persian, Muslim, Canadian. In that order? So I have, not necessarily, not necessarily. <laughs> All of these are there, and, and my identity profile are basically uh, incorporating all these different elements. So I have something in common with any of these communities, and that allows me to have a dialogue and a conversation with all of these and feel a part of all of them. And I don't feel forced to choose between them. Okay, let's follow up in the studio. Quam, then Russ. Ren. Are you asking me what I uh, call myself? Sure. Or? Oh, well, um, that's easy for me because I only landed a couple of weeks ago, so I'm only just a landed immigrant before that. I was on a work permit, so I was very definitely English. I am not a Canadian citizen. I am, uh, for my um, sorrows, a Leafs fan. <laughs> I am also a Liverpool uh, FC fan, and I'm a psychiatrist and a doctor. I've got lots of different cultures uh, are running you, are through me. Are you telling me you self-identify almost as much as a long-suffering Leaf and Liverpool fan as you do with being a Brit? I'm going to the Leafs tonight, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm thinking about how bad it's going to be. But you know, no, seriously, I mean, but seriously, I would usually put myself as being uh, British first. Hmm. Uh, that's where I was born, that's a culture I was brought up in. Uh, an aspiring Canadian, I'll get there eventually, I would, I would think. But I have some problems with the ideas that we've come up with so far about being uh, less concrete as a mosaic is and more uh, sort of impressionistic. What's your problem with it? People have to know what they're letting themselves in for and they have to, have, the, the identities tend to be formed against things that are very clear. Mm -hmm. And um, if you're coming to this country, uh, you need to know what's expected of you. And if it's expected that you're going to somehow be in an identity that doesn't really have any boundaries and it's not clear what you're actually letting yourself in for, so why would you choose that okay. over a long history uh, of a culture that you already have? It's a, it's a very odd idea. We, we, we do need to do the work, I think, as Canadians to work out what, what, what a Canadian is. One more follow-up with you, because you self-identify as a Brit, now living an aspiring Canadian. Yeah. Lee Fan, Liverpool, we got that. When did you go to China? When, when did I? you last go to China? I went, last went to China in 2005 or 2006. What, what did you notice about how people regarded you, or for that matter, anybody else who wasn't Chinese there? There were two things that happened in China that were interesting. One was that everybody wanted to have a picture taken with me, and I presume that was because I was, uh, I was black rather than because I was uh, particularly good looking. Um, uh, not, you're not supposed to laugh nervously there, <laughs> but anyway. Um, but the other thing was that people were very clearly, I got the clear sense that people felt sorry for me and for my wife and for other people who were traveling with us. How would you infer that? Uh, from the conversations we had with people and things. People were very, very proud of being Chinese, very proud of being the cradle of civilization. And the impression that I got from talking to people is, you know, they were felt to a certain extent um, sorry for us that we weren't Chinese. That's the impression we, we got. Isn't that interesting? It was incredibly attractive, actually. This is a group of people who are so comfortable 
um, with their history that you know they you know it wasn't anything malicious, but it was you know it's a shame you're not Chinese. You know <laughs> we're the greatest people in the world, and um, that's you know that's quite an attractive and quite mm. an alluring thing when you go to a different country. Randall, you want to follow up on that? Well, I want you to want come to back. Yeah, yeah, I want to come back. If that's all right, to this issue of multiple yeah. identities. Sure. And I think, in fact, if if there's any danger of putting people in box, that danger lies in rhetorical multiculturalism, because what you're saying is the most essential thing about a person is that they're black or they're Persian or they're Muslim or they're Indian or whatever. You're saying effectively the limits of people's culture are the limits of their world. As a X, I believe X. That which allows a multiplicity of identities is called freedom. It's called liberalism. It's called a liberal democracy. Uh, where you can choose whatever identity you want to have, where you can move between communities, where you can switch religions, where you can be fundamentally gay or fundamentally conservative. Frankly, we don't need multicultural for that, multiculturalism for that uh, because we have it already. I want to follow up with Irene on, on something that I remember President Obama, he wasn't president yet, he was campaigning to be president at the time, and I remember thinking this then and waiting for the moment when we would be doing a program where this little observation for what it's worth might be applicable, and I think the moment has come. I remember the president constantly in his efforts to reach out to potential voters talking about white Americans and African Americans and Latino Americans and Aboriginal Americans. And that was it. Somehow everybody in the states ended up in one of those four buckets. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, you couldn't do that in Canada because we're just way more, you know, we got way more buckets than that. Now as a Canadian working in the states, where do you come down on that? Uh you know, a lot of that has to do with the history of the United States, but other parts of it are pretty modern creations. So let me talk about both of those parts. I mean, sure. the situation of African Americans in the United States is clearly one where African Americans have an extremely strong sense of collective identity given the history of slavery in this country and the um, egregious segregation and oppression that many faced up to the 60s and arguably still face difficulties today in terms of extremely high residential segregation rates um, for black Americans compared to almost any other group in the country. And so, you know, survey after survey shows that African Americans, especially those born in this country and have parents born in this country, um, have a very strong collective identity as African Americans. Now, interestingly, the category of Latino or Hispanic is a much more recent creation. This is something that people have now embraced here in the University of California. Um, many of my students uh, will identify as Latino. Um, but this was not something that was very common in the 1970s. Uh, people would be Puerto Rican or they'd be Mexican American. Um, and they didn't say that they were Latino, but it was a combination of census categories, a combination of affirmative action programs, um, pro basically entrepreneurship among certain groups that thought that that was a good category to move forward, and then also the media, um, Spanish-speaking media uh, in terms of trying to form uh, an audience that they could appeal to. Uh, really tried to promote this idea of Latino. And so today, yes, you're right, we talk about um, probably actually less about Aboriginals in the United States than in Canada, but Asian Americans, Latinos, African Americans, and then sort of the, the, the default category is whites. Um, and, and it's a very different dynamic than in Canada, I think, on that respect. Indeed. Quam, a follow-up. I think that the situation we're getting into at the moment is we're trying to disaggregate this idea of, of multiculturalism because at times we're talking about culture and then we can be many different cultures. At other times we're talking about organization of groups around uh, political themes to a certain extent. The African American uh, group is partly a political group as well as, as other things. And then other times we're talking about ethnicity which is a group that you feel that you belong to which isn't always a cultural group. Mm. And so we're getting a lot of different terms uh, mixed up, and that's why we have difficulty sometimes moving the conversation forward. Because I think everybody would agree that most people have a number of different cultural elements that mm -hmm. goes through them. But we also realize that if you just go around Toronto, that a whole group of people with lots of different cultural elements want to live together in one area and want to group together because they see that um, they have more similarities and differences. So, uh, but that doesn't stop people being sort of, you know, uh, African, uh, Canadian and gay. 
It doesn't stop people being sort of African Canadian and Muslim. It doesn't stop people being African Canadian and Christian. But mm -hmm. you know, people do group together for various reasons. All right, let me go to Abdi on this then. And it occurs to me, as soon as the words were out of my mouth, I think the president, the now president, used to have five identifying features. It was black, white, Asian, Latino, and then Native Americans. So I think there were five groups. But still, that wouldn't compare to Canada. And uh, Abdi, on this issue then, are we done then? Are, are things too complicated? Have they progressed so far nowadays that using terms like melting pot and mosaic just don't make any sense anymore? Uh, I think they were not uh, too useful concepts to begin with at the time that they were uh, much more popular than today. Uh, partly because they are more sort of simplified concepts that are good uh, to serve as the two ends of a continuum so that we can look at every particular community and decide whether they are closer to this end or the other one. Not necessarily as characterizations of one whole society with all the diverse things that are happening within them. That's, that's one thing. On this issue of uh, multiple identity that uh, we were talking about before, I think what Irene mentioned is an important uh, development and is something that uh, is happening in Canada to some extent as well. The folks that are coming from Muslim countries initially identified themselves as being Syrian and Egyptian and Moroccan, but over time they developed this sort of common identity uh, to be a part of the Arab uh, group or the Muslim groups. And this is uh, the direct product of the kind of interaction and experiences that they have here in Canada. My uh, point is that we can see that the, the fluid nature of these identities, and that basically it speaks to the fact that uh, the identity that they have developed is the result of their experiences as it can go on. It can incorporate the Canadian identity as well through the same uh, mechanism. So basically, uh, we don't really have to uh, spend too much time on whether it is the melting pot scenario or multiculturalism. I think both of them can come together through a process that needs a little bit of creativity. And if you had some time, I can talk about some of the ideas that uh, my research has shown as the, sort of the guidelines for some future policies. Okay, well just b before we do that, I, I do want to share a bit more polling information as we did off the top of the program. And we're going to call this graphic the two R's. Because as much as we asked earlier, as much as Angus Reid asked earlier, uh, some questions about where we were versus multi, you know, uh, multiculturalism, mosaic, melting pot. They also did some polling on the issues of intolerance. And let's bring those up if we can now, Michael. Which groups in Canada, we were asked, which groups in Canada uh, face intolerance? And Muslims are at the top of the list, 33%, the most disliked group in Canada. The second largest number from respondents, immigrants from India and Pakistan, so South Asian. 16% then said immigrants from Africa. And 10% said immigrants from China. Questions not about their own prejudices, but about the perception of Canadian attitudes. That's what it was about. Now, we, I, I think it's fair to say that we've traditionally in this, in this country thought of um, these kinds of issues as being issues of racism, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're issues now about religion. Randall, you want to go there? Is it more now about religion than race? Uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, <clears throat> it's hard to know how to read that data because that either could say, well, there's lots of prejudice towards Muslims, or in fact, there's not because lots of people are worried that there's prejudice towards Muslims and therefore are sensitive to the problem. Certainly, we're spending a lot of time talking about religion uh, these days, a lot of time talking about Islam. And I think the danger in that, and this might be the burden of your question, is that we're ignoring racist exclusion, which is still very much with us and very prevalent in the, uh, in the city of Toronto, as indeed in the wider, wider world. And we're ignoring what fundamentally matters, which isn't culture, which is work, which is economic integration, ensuring people have jobs, ensuring those jobs provide opportunities for them and their family. So I think much of the discussion of religion, which is really a discussion of Islam, is a distraction from what really matters. Irene, what's your take on that? I agree with Randall that um, it, a very important challenge um, for, for Canadians is the economic integration, you know, integration into our educational institutions of um, immigrants and their children. Um, on one level, though, I, I take some comfort in the recent Statistics Canada report that showed that the children of immigrants actually went to university more than the children of native-born Canadians. Now, obviously, I'm somewhat of a product of that, so I'm glad to see that I'm doing well. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I disagree a little bit with what was said about um, multiculturalism not really being that important or that that's not part of the picture because 
I think that fundamentally we have to make sure that immigrants and their children are being treated equally and are getting all the opportunities that they should have in the workplace and in other elements of Canadian society. But I also think that multiculturalism, at least in the past, played an incredibly important role in changing sort of the symbolic order in Canada. I mean, if you go back to the 60s and you look at the tenor of the debates in Canadian newspapers and in the Parliament, the only discussion was about the two founding races, and that was the language that was used, the English and the French. And there was really no room at all um, for people who might have different cultural backgrounds. And whether they practiced those cultures or whether they just identified with them, um, there wasn't a discourse in Canada to include them to the extent that is done today. So I actually think that multiculturalism has been extremely important for giving people the sense that they are part of the society and that they can therefore make claims. And so that when there's discrimination and when they're being treated unequally because of their religion, they can say, wait a second, you guys say that you are a multicultural society and you welcome diversity and look how I'm being treated. I wonder if you could put a, a kind of a target date on when you think that happened. I guess some people would say when, when the first non-English, non-French prime minister was elected, John Diefenbaker in the, le in the late 50s, you could start the clock then. Is that when you'd do it? I don't know. I mean, Diefenbaker, if you read, uh, if you read some of the things that he said in the House of Commons, he was, he was a pretty strong Anglophile and, and pretty proud of the Commonwealth, if not the Empire. Um, you know, some people would, would uh, date it from 1971 when Pierre Trudeau announced a policy of multiculturalism in the House of Commons. Um, I think in a sociological sense, it really began when educational institutions like elementary schools started taking very seriously the idea that you're not only going to learn about the loyalist when you're talking about Ontario history, um, but you're going to talk about the contribution of other Canadians. And for example, in BC, or hopefully in all Canadian textbooks, talk about the contribution, say, of Chinese Canadians in building the railroad, um, the contribution of Aboriginals, uh, and, and sort of the interplay of many different people in building Canada. Gotcha. Quam, how about on this issue of, of whether prejudice has migrated from, say, race to religion? What do you think on that? I think that uh, prejudice has in the past been religion, then it moved to race, and now it's back to religion again. So probably the first race riot that there was in uh, Toronto was in Christie Pitts, and that was a religious uh, riot. In the UK, we had the black shirts in the uh, 1930s. Again, it was anti-Jew. So um, there have, religion has always been important. Uh, it's just uh, you know, racism changes over time, discrimination changes over time. And uh, so we're back in an era where we're talking about religion. Not, not to pick this apart too much, but I, I presume the Christie pitch you're talking about is the, you know, when there were a group of Jews, I guess, who got into a fight there over issues really leading up to World War II. But the people who were beating up the Jews that day in Christie Pitts in downtown Toronto may have felt that they were not beating up people of a certain religion, but rather of a certain race. And therefore, this is, you know, consistent with, you know? I understand, but that's part of the, you know, if we talk about race, race often doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, we have okay. all over the world. We have people of very similar races saying that they're different races, and we talked about the English and the French race, who were the founding founders of Canada, as if the English and the French are a different race. race. Yes, interesting. Okay, well put, Randall. Follow. Uh, just a small distinction I want to introduce. I mean, there is a difference between opposing someone's religion. And even, though I wouldn't encourage it, of course, hating someone's religion and hating their race. And if you, and I put it as baldly as this, you can't possibly object to a person for being black. This is absurd. But you might object to Islam. You might object to Christianity. You might object to Judaism. And I think it's important that we don't blur, we be sensitive to Islamophobia, which is real, but not say, not blur those two categories of opposition to religion and racism, because they are making, distinct. Why are you making the distinction? What well, is Well, for example, it came out in the Danish cartoon controversy that someone said, the argument was made that the, I know it's, you've been through it on TVO, but the <laughs> argument was made that somehow caricaturing the Prophet Muhammad, because that was offensive to people, was the equivalent of racism against Afro-Canadians. And to my mind, those two remain fundamentally distinct for precisely the reason that I hope I've articulated, but I could try again if I failed. No, no, I guess you. Okay. I just seeing where you were going with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, can we bring up this next graphic, Michael? How about this? And the number of Muslims in Canada is expected to nearly triple in the next 20 years. So today there are just under a million, about 2.8% of the population. But fast forward a couple of decades, and you've got a Muslim population in Canada at 2.7 million, the prognosticators say, which will take us up to more than 6.5% of the population. And Abdi, I guess that includes you. And I wonder how different from Europe can we expect our relationship 
with the growing Muslim population in Canada to be? Uh, I think that would depend on a couple of different things. One is uh, the rate uh, at which the population of Muslims uh, increases in different regions. I think the main issue uh, the, that has created sort of a backlash or has triggered anti-immigration or anti-certain groups sentiments uh, has not been really the overall population of the, those groups in the country, but the rate at which it has increased. Uh, we have something in southern Alberta that is called the Brooks uh, phenomenon, and that basically refers to something that happened a few years back in a small town in southern Alberta, in which uh, a huge number of Sudanese immigrants were just uh, brought into the city, and uh, it created all sorts of tensions and conflicts. So, that rate of increase in the population of Muslims in different regions, I guess, is, is a major factor to, uh, that would basically influence the outcome of this process. The second thing is that uh, up to now, the Muslim population in Canada has shown that they are different from the Muslims in Europe or to some extent even in the U.S. by uh, showing a very moderate uh, voice or having a moderate voice. If that continues to be the fact, then I think that would create a, a big difference uh, between Canada and uh, the situation in Europe. And the third one is the fact that uh, in many situations, we have got all the big institutions right, basically uh, all the stuff that uh, Irene and Randall were talking about. We have got this uh, equal, equality of opportunities, educational opportunities, economic opportunities. I think there is a need to go beyond that. And uh, I see that recently uh, there are some promotion uh, and some efforts being put into promoting sort of intercultural and interfaith dialogues. I think we need to go beyond this and create some uh, the space or some environments in which people of these different backgrounds, including Muslims and non-Muslims, can come together, work together, and interact with each other in a positive environment. Okay. And if that happens, I don't think that uh, the population per se is going to be a problem. Quinn, you wanted to follow. Yes, I, I think there are two things I want to say. One, it's a tremendous opportunity uh, to have that connection to the rest of the world and the rest of the Muslim world. Um, that term's used a lot. I'm not completely sure where the Muslim world is, sure. uh, but it's, it's used a lot. It's not a monolithic lot. thing. You can't no. describe it that way. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, but just to pick up a, a slight disagreement uh, with Abdi, because I think that um, because of some of the voices that come out of uh, Europe, people think that actually um, the Muslim population of Europe is in some ways not moderate the vast majority of the Muslim population uh, in Europe is, com is very moderate. And there is a very small percentage that is not so. And um, I think it's important when we're talking about that population just to keep that in mind. Although that, you know, it, uh, it's a given, small the, percentage. Uh, given the way the media work these days, of course, the, the small percentage that would be quite Get radical is the time. one we hear yeah. a lot about. But that's and you would have seen them a lot in London, I imagine, too. Uh, very rarely. So <laughs> that's, a, that's the whole point. Very, 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 very rare. You would have seen them on your telly quite frequently. Yes, you'd have seen them on the television, but this is, you know, I, I, I lived around the corner from Finsbury Park Mosque, which is uh, well known. Sure. Um, but um, no, that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a rare thing. Okay. Randall? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I sort of agree and I, I sort of don't. I mean, the broad point that the vast majority of European Muslims are moderate is clear. I mean, there, there can be no debate about that. But there's also, I think... Um, what do you mean uh, there can be no debate about that? There can be debate about anything, can't there? Well, when, you, when you've got hundreds of thousands of Muslims in Europe, if they were all immoderate, you would see much more violence than you do. I mean, the majority are getting on with their lives. But I still think there is a difference between Europe and Canada. Muslims here overall are more educated, overall are more secular. We have a large Iranian population. Germany is complicated, of course, with the Turks. And the issues of poverty and resentment and Islamism, and we can measure this in uh, public opinion polls, they are more prevalent in Europe than they are here. So I'm more optimistic 
about the future in Canada exactly as, as FD said. I mean, the one wild card is if there's an Islamist attack in Canada. Canadians are terribly politically correct. But the moment a bomb, they're also differential to state authority, and the moment a bomb goes off, there will be a hardening of attitudes in this country with incredible and terrifying speed. That's and, a wild card. And at that point, all bets are off. All bets are absolutely off. Okay. Irene, can I get you to weigh in on this issue of the, uh, the future growing Muslim population of Canada and what you anticipate the relationship between that population and the rest of Canada to be? I'm relatively optimistic about how Canada um, will deal with that. Um, one of the things that happens, I think, in continental Europe, I'm not as familiar with the UK, is that in places like Scandinavia and in the Netherlands, part of the public's distrust with Muslims is because the public, um, the majority population, is extremely secular. Uh, they very, many of them are atheist or at least agnostic and they don't really understand how people can still believe in God to an extent. Um, in the U.S. case, you have the opposite. Um, you have very few people in the United States who do not believe in God and many of them believe in a Christian God and feel very strongly about that. And so there, there's also sometimes um, tensions. And in Canada, you sort of have something in between. You have segments of the Canadian population um, that don't uh, feel very strongly around religion and you have others that do, but I think in that mix there's going to be more room for people to integrate whether they're more secular Muslims and see sort of being Muslim as a cultural identity or people who are more religious and uh, would like to build mosques and have prayer rooms and such. Okay, let's follow up on this because we've got about five minutes and change to go here. And Quam, I want to start with you. On this issue of uh, a more perfect union, if I can put it that way, and having um, better immigration in the country, immigration that works better. In what ways should the Canadian government manage levels and types of immigration so as not to aggravate the process of integration? What do you think? I think that um, the most important thing or one of the most important things will be to be clear. I was uh, taken by what uh, Randall was saying about the idea of both uh, economic and social integration and not about the idea of assimilation or uh, sort of people losing their cultures. Because one of the uh, trigger points uh, at the moment for a lot of people is believing that they're coming to have a certain type of life. They've come as a doctor, they're going to be able to practice. They've come as an accountant, they're going to be able to practice. And then finding they're not able to do so, coming with a university degree and finding that they're not going to be able to um, they're not going to be able to pra practice um, their profession. So we've got to be straight with people. So you've got to be straight with people. If we're in a situation where we're saying you know, to people, well, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry, this isn't going to happen for you, but it's going to be great for your kids, you know, people can live with that. But it's gotta, you've got to be completely clear in who you're bringing, why you're bringing them, what you're bringing them for, and then helping people to get what you promised. I'll tell you one of the things we've heard all week long, numerous times, is that the proficiency in English, or for that matter in French, that you need before you can get into this country is here, but the proficiency of English you need to really engage in Canadian society is here. And it does no good to bring people into this country who can't speak the language as well as they ought to be able to when they can't really partake of the country in a way that would make them feel fully Canadian. Well, you also have a federal and provincial disconnect. So you can get in under the federal criteria right. and they will recognize your degree and then you come into a provin and province mm -hmm. and a province will say, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, you can't practice. And then we get back to even if you have got a degree that we recognize, you haven't got Canadian experience. Right. And I think sorting out those sorts of things as well as spending more time and money on um, how we deal with our cultural diversity is going to be very important okay. going forward. Let me go to Abdi on this. Same question, Abdi. In what way should the Canadian government manage levels and types of immigration so as not to aggravate the process of integration? I think, like I mentioned before, uh, the level and the numbers are probably not uh, problematic by themselves, depending on what happens to them afterward and af after they come into the Canadian society. One thing, another type of disconnect that is there in that this whole immigration landscape is the disconnect between the engagement and the involvement of government, federal or provincial, uh, 
during the phase of selecting immigrants and then the total absence of these uh, federal and provincial governments afterwards. So we make sure that uh, we look in, into all the possible information, available information, to pick the right immigrants. And then after they arrive in Canada, we just leave them alone. And they are in the hands of the market forces, basically. And I have seen many immigrants uh, that uh, have come with the right qualifications and everything. And then here are struggling with finding a place to live because uh, the landlords, for example, want them to provide some sort of uh, document uh, to show that they have some income, or they need some Canadian to uh, co-sign their uh, lease. So, I mean, there are some very simple things that can be done after they arrive here that can ease up this process of integration for them. And I have to highlight this fact that it is extremely, extremely important to do a little bit of managing, not not over management, but a little bit of managing of the first three years, three to five years that immigrants are here. That has a huge influence in terms of shaping up, up their opinions about uh, the rest of Canadian society, about their future, the future of their children here. So if they develop, uh, if they have a positive experience during that period, I think uh, the process would be much more smoothly after that. Gotcha. Randall, last minute here. Is there a reason to think that the integration of immigrants ought to focus on individuals as opposed to groups. Oh, well, absolutely. I mean, I think the fundamental point, as I've said from the beginning, is uh, economic and educational opportunity. So we can pay attention to the aggregates, but the question is, how are these individuals inserting themselves into the Canadian labor market? That is the fundamental question that raises these other issues of language and training that have come up. Great. Irene, you want the last 30 seconds to finish it off? Sure. Um, I would like to say that one of the things that has really been successful in Canadian immigration policy is the fact that many, most people, the vast majority of people, come as permanent residents. I mean, uh, Kwame talked about how he had just gotten his permanent residency, and that tells the immigrant that we want you to become a permanent member of this society. I think one of the dangers right now in Canadian policy is the move to temporary visas and temporary migrants, because as the Europeans found out, there's nothing more permanent than a temporary migrant, <laughs> but you're telling those people that we really don't want you. We want you to work here a few years and then we want you to go away. And that's actually, I think, more of a danger for social cohesion than a lot of these other things. Understood. I want to thank all four of you for a really interesting conversation tonight. Uh, the fourth of our f five parts on uh, immigration and its discontent, starting with the delightfully Canadian Irene Blumgad <laughs> coming to us from Berkeley, California. Abdi Kazemapur, the sociologist at the University of uh, Lethbridge. Thank you two both for being there on the line for us. Randall Hansen, the political scientist from the University of Toronto, and the aspiring Canadian, Quam McKenzie, the psychiatrist from CAMH. Thanks so much, everybody. Appreciate your time tonight.